Um, I want to talk today about why spatial cognition is important, not only from the cognitive science perspective, but also from the learning sciences perspective, why it's important in education and in the process of learning. I'll talk about uh, two aspects of spatial cognition that I think are particularly important. I don't want to use the word uniquely human because it would be wrong, but it, it is special to humans, which are thinking about relations and thinking about space through symbols. Uh, and I'll be focusing on maps and gesture in this case, where most of the time that question would be addressed through language, but I'll make the argument that there are other spatial symbols that are equally, if not more, important. And I'll be talking about the development of these special um, aspects of uh, spatial cognition. And then at the end, if there's time, I will, um, borrowing from my uh, colleague Brian Reiser, talks about recovering psychologists, which are psychologists who leave the lab and begin the 12 steps of uh, applying what they know to the, to the real world. Uh, I'm one-third education, so I'm reaching step four. Um, and, and maybe if there's time, you can help me with my, my journey of recovery. Okay. It won't take me long to convince you that spatial cognition is important, not only for navigation, getting around in the world, but also for some of the things that, that really define us as a species, like toolmaking is really about relations amongst things in space, following a spatial plan, thinking about how the tool relates to the task. All these involve spatial imagery, spatial analysis, um, and spatial reasoning also underlies um, things that we wouldn't immediately think about as spatial, but we've come to represent them spatially and, and have get, gotten great advantages from doing so. I could describe to you the relationships between dinosaurs or various species, and that's not inherently spatial, but representing it, as Laura Novick and her colleagues have shown, in a spatial representation allows us to think about relations in a way that would, might be intractable or obtuse otherwise. So space is the basis for navigation, tool making, but also thinking and communicating in general. It's also important for performance in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Um, these disciplines are all highly spatial. Anecdotally, at least, um, top achievers in these fields often describe their great insights in terms of spatial moments, if you will. Uh, Watson and Quick, Quick for example, uh, discovered the DNA molecule and, and its structure was a double helix and that insight, that spatial insight, allowed them to uh, explain uh, DNA and how it works. And before that, calculate with the benzene molecule. And so there's a lot of examples in science of the sort of key moment being a, a spatial moment. And we don't have to just rely on anecdotal evidence. Some research done by um, people here has shown that spatial ability has a unique predictive value in determining which students go into um, engineering or science fields. Uh, these arrows that you see are, are represent uh, spatial ability, scaled on the same scale as verbal and, and math SAT. And, and I'm preaching to the choir here, so I'll preach real quickly. Um, but what, the, what it shows is a unique uh, effect of spatial skill in predicting things like engineering, uh, electrical engineering, and physical science. So if we want to uh, enhance American capital, if you will, in sciences and engineering, which I think is a, is a national goal that many of us share, then spatial ability may well be a place that we want to look at and focus. And that's begun to be recognized. Uh, John Reiser and others working on, with the National Research Council have re recently issued a report, Learning to Think Spatially, where they they talk about a, the importance of a spatial-based curriculum, how new modes of thinking about relations, again, amongst things in the world will require new spatial tools and new spatial reasoning. And there's recently been the, one of the science and learning centers that is focused on spatial reasoning, too. So there is a growing movement, a growing recognition that it's not just something that we should study in the lab, but also something that matters in the real world. What's special about human spatial cognition? Well, I've already foreshadowed that by saying that I think there are two answers. There's probably more than that, too, but two that I'll talk about. One is relational thinking, and the second is aspects of culture and communication, language, gesture, maps, and diagrams. As I said, most of the time this talk would be about language, but we're going to talk about uniquely spatial symbols, what we can do with our hands and what we can do with, uh, with uh, sort of archive records of communication that are done visually. So let's begin by talking about relational thinking. This is the properties that emerge by uniquely from comparing one thing to another. They're not given by one, any one characteristic of an object. They transcend the objects. For example, if you're trying to understand the analogy that the solar system is like the atom, it doesn't help you very much if I tell you that the sun is yellow, right? That's giving you a property of an individual object. What you care about to understand the richness of that analogy and to make sense and to make predictions and make inferences is about the pattern of relationships. You care in this case about orbits. 
that is a relation between something in the center and things going around it in particular ways. And understanding that relation is what makes the analogy possible. So um, understanding relations is really key to much of human thought. Um, it's, it's key to um, language and verbs and spatial reasoning. Um, what makes these diagrams useful and so powerful and why, as Laura and Kevin Catley have argued, why they underlie the development of biological thinking in the modern, in modern times is because they help us to think about relations both across space or, in this case, across time. So um, that kind of relational thinking is really what, what makes space so important. So I'd like to talk about the emergence of this in young children, sort of studying how it might come to be and uh, how we differ in some ways from many other species. Um, there are, now I'm going to switch to the discussion of spatial coding, how we keep track of the location of an object in space. So this is a very simple task that I want you to imagine, that I um, have hidden something at the brown circle, and I need to remember it, and there happens to be a tree. Well, one way that we share with almost all uh, mobile organisms is the ability to code it in terms of a vector, of an angle and a distance, to a single object. This is not relational in the sense that there's nothing about the relations amongst landmarks. And that makes sense when I show you something like this. Here, the possibility of relational coding emerges. Because there's two ways I could code this location. I could continue, as gerbils do, to code it like this, just related to this one tree. But now there's an emergent or potentially emergent property that I can use, the rectangle that's formed by the square. So it's in essence at the center, center of gravity of the square that's formed, a rectangle that's formed by, this, by, the, uh, by the trees. So this is, there's nothing about any specific distance that specifies that. It's the relations amongst the trees and of the hidden toy to those relations that specifies its location. How could we tell the difference? As I said, you could use either form of coding here. Why use four things when you got one that works well? Well, there are some ways that uh, researchers, particularly in the non-human um, literature, have, have used, which involve translating the, uh, the um, uh, landmarks or otherwise moving them. Now, trees don't usually move, but um, in, in laboratory experiments, people have done things like moving uh, chairs or other kinds of landmarks that, that organisms might use to code to try to differentiate between the two types of coding. Because if the organism is relying on vector coding, it will make a distinctive error. It will search here. Because it's preserving the vector. See, this is the, right, the same angle and distance to that one landmark. But if it relies on relational coding, then it will search in the middle. Now, we know that vector coding emerges quite early, and as I said, we share this with a number of non-human species, at least down the road and probably way below that, um, at least by the end of the first year, and probably sooner, depending on if you want to argue about the measures, because uh, now you're start ta talking about non-mobile organisms if you go too long below one, so it gets confusing. But at least by the time that we can show that kids are mobile, uh, I mean walking, uh, we can show that they have vector coding. Uh, but for relational coding, the results seem inconsistent or, or paradoxical. On the, on the one hand, there's evidence of very early use of geometry. And geometry seems to imply a set of relations because you're describing uh, relations amongst parts that fit together to form a shape. Does everybody know this research by Hermann Spelke? Well, I'll quickly go through it. The child's brought into the room, shown a, uh, a toy that can be hidden in one of the four corners. And here comes the trick they then disorient the child, blindfold him and spin him around just a few times, just enough to get through IRB. Okay. And then take the blindfold off and ask him or her to search. And children make a very characteristic and interesting error. Uh, they either search at the correct location or at the geometrically uh, similar or identical location. So they either search here or here. At about 50-50, rarely do they search in these other corners. Okay. What's particularly interesting about this is that this error persisted even when Hermer and Spelke put what would seem to be the most obvious possible landmark you could think of. They, put one, they made one of the walls blue, put a blue curtain over it. And so now this should be a really easy task because you say, it's the one by the blue wall or it's not the one by the blue wall. Duh. But it turns out for young kids, kids less than about four or five, it's not a duh. They continue to make the same errors, in essence ignoring the landmark. Now, there is a whole lot of literature on this, debating this back and forth, whether it's true, under what circumstances. 
for purposes of this talk, that doesn't really matter. What does matter is it shows that there is the possibility of geometric coding. No one debates that anymore. Infants can use vectors, but they can also use geometric coding. So then I'm done. There's relational coding, there's vector coding, let's all go home, but not quite. Um, children seem to have much more trouble inferring geometric knowledge. And what do I mean by inferring? Well, I'm back to the same kind of task I just described with those four trees. <coughs> since you've already been primed and since you're adults and you're smart, um, you would see this not only as four stars, but also probably as a square or a rectangle. Um, but, we, but when children are asked to code in this way, uh, for example, doing the middle coding that I talked about earlier, before age five or six, they, they fail at this task. They, in essence, behave like gerbils, searching at one location and ignoring the relations amongst them. And I found that kind of paradoxical that on the one hand, we have geometric uh, coding at age two and a half, but yet what's so much harder about using the geometry when it's defined by these, um, these diagrams? And I think we have something of an answer to that. So my, my goal is to demonstrate relational coding, and it's the simplest possible relation, which is middle. There's, I don't think there's any, well, we could debate about between versus middle, but we won't. Um, let's say that middle is, a, is, it is obviously a very simple relation, but it is a, definitely a relation because you can't describe middle with any specific distance or angle. It is an emergent property of at least two objects. Um, and I'll consider a new explanation for why children have trouble inferring geometry when they do so well on the uh, Hermer and Spelke. And the idea is that to, um, to, to, to solve this inference task, to see emergent structure, you have to be able to think simultaneously about the individual objects and the emergent structure. And we've taken that for granted, but it's something that's really in a developmental process that I'm going to show you evidence for the, the development of the ability to transcend individual landmarks, infer structure, and then use that structure to code spatial information, something that I think um, is special for humans. I keep talking about humans and non-humans. This is one of the heroes of the bird world. This is um, Cluck. Clark, Clark's Nutcracker, a relative of the Jay and Crow. It's a very, very smart bird. This, to my knowledge, at least when the time when I started doing this, was the only non-human organism that could solve the middle problem, where it would use middle as a unique relationship. And it has a very special uh, environmental push towards uh, doing that, or evolutionary push towards doing that. Since that time, several other organisms have been shown to do it. But at least most rodent species don't. And I'll show you what they do in a second. So I just want to acknowledge that birds are smart, and now I'm going to say that uh, at least this one bird, and then I'm going to move on and, and talk about not-so-smart gerbils. Okay, so we're starting with a very simple relation, middle. Okay. We can tell whether uh, an organism uses middle as a relational code by doing what I talked about at the beginning, spreading the landmarks apart or, or shrinking them. Okay. Uh, Colette et al. did this experiment with gerbils. They hit a seed and they train them for like six or seven days in darkness. It's just like, it makes me glad I don't work with animals, but it's, it's really a very intensive training process. So they keep having the organism search at a location until it learns to find it. The critical question is, what information is it learning to keep track of the uh, hidden seed? And you should see, again, there's an ambiguity here. It could use the distance from either one of these landmarks, or it could use the relation. And what does it do? Well, when they spread them apart, this is what gerbils do. They search at the, at the location that preserves the distance, and as a result, they go hungry because it's hidden in the middle. The, the location never changes. The, an, the landmark positions change, and the animal search changes accordingly. But if they were thinking about this as middle, they should still get it correct. Everybody? Okay. Now, we basically went on to replicate this study with, with kids. We wanted to see, we basically asked, what would a four-year-old child do in this? Do they, uh, given what we've seen about the emergence of, of, of relational coding in some of the studies, we might predict that they would fail because they, they don't seem to infer the structure. But those earlier studies were pretty hard because you had like four or five different things and you have to infer shape amongst them. So we decided to try the, the Colette et al. experiment with young kids. Basically, what we did is try to scale everything to gerbil space. Not easy to do in the Chicago area to find a field uh, this empty. Um, this is about 50 miles west of Chicago. 
um, and it's a prairie preserve, so you could bury the, uh, the thing in the natural Illinois prairie grasses, and the child then walks up and gets it. Now, some people ask, why did you test children there only four? Why didn't you go younger? The grass is already up to their... <laughs> uh, this is one of the two studies where I ever thought, now I'm going to actually get some IRB issues. This one actually has... You've got Lyme disease. You've got getting lost in the grass. Um, no problem at all. And the, and the other one was um, having them walk in their neighborhood and cross streets, and I'm like, oh, I'm kind of worried about this. We've got to make sure they're safe. That one sailed through. But if I ask what kind of car do you like to drive to an adult, that had problems. But in any case... Um, this is scaled up to about, roughly speaking, the, um, the Colette et al. space. Now, you might notice these distant landmarks. Again, it's still suburban Chicago. It's hard to get rid of trees and buildings and everything else. Uh, we worry about distant landmarks because that could be a form of vector coding. Uh, two answers to that. One, sort of practical and that they're really far away. And you should say, who cares? But two, empirically, I can show you that they didn't use them. Okay, so basically this is a replication of the Colette et al. experiment, but with young kids. Now we have what we call the one landmark training condition and the two landmark training condition. The two landmark training condition is really the, the true test of the relational thing. But the one landmark also allows us to ask additional questions. Do they also code vector? If they code middle, what do they do when there's only one? And so we can actually look at both of those questions. So we um, follow training and testing procedure like this. Um, where we started with either one or two landmarks. In the two landmark condition, we trained them with the landmarks close, then we spread them apart, then we took one away. Okay, now this is an interesting paradox for them. This is the true test right here. If they get it, then, they, then they're not acting like the gerbils and they must be using some form of relational coding. Now what happens when I take one of these away? Uh, do they still infer where it was based on one landmark or do they demonstrate some sort of vector coding? And then finally, test four allows us to get at the problem of the distant landmarks because if they're getting it right all the time and I take all the proximal landmarks away, which are just little chairs, and they still get it right, I got a big problem. It means nothing I did mattered. But that's not what happened because um, in the test four, they do much worse. Okay, so here is the results, and this is like the cleanest data I've ever gotten because you really don't need any statistics. You can just see where, where the data are. Um, and on test one, where we spread the landmarks apart, again, these are just portable lawn chairs, we do it so the child can't see. As he's walking back from the hidden location, we spread the landmarks apart. And everybody got it right in the middle. So they're, they're not like gerbils. They do, at least by four, and are probably by three, have their relational concept down. They searched in the middle. Now, a very interesting thing happens when we took one of the landmarks away. Okay. None of this, again, is done in view of the child. As they're walking back, somebody's behind them, and they very quietly pick up one or two of the chairs and move them around. And look what happens. Now their searches are off by the same distance that was originally present here. So what's going on here? The argument that we made after, you know, and debated, and um, I, I think is right, but it's a little um, inelegant, so... You know, if you think of alternate explanations, let me know. We think that children, unlike gerbils, have both forms of coding. They have relational coding, which is primary, so when they're both available, they use relational. When one is available, they use only, they, use, they revert to the vector coding, okay? And now they're coding it in terms of a vector. So they must have learned or remembered both during the initial trial because we can see both types of search patterns, one based on relational coding, one based on vector coding. When we look at the other landmark, we get the exact sort of symmetric error, if you will, uh, when we, um, they search three meters off to the left, which again is predicted if they, they knew both vectors and the relation, or are able to infer. But remember now, they're not getting it right on trials two and three. They are searching at the wrong place after having gotten it right on previous trials, directly as a result of the removal of one landmark. On test four, now, there's no landmarks. Um, now, they are way off. They don't get it right. They're not all over the field. They're within 9 to 12 meters, which is a, a lot of space, but um, there might be some sort of dead reckoning or something to get you kind of reasonably close, but they're clearly not using the distant landmarks to, to find it. Now let's look at the results for the one landmark training condition where we um, train them with a single landmark. Okay. 
Now here, this is just pure vector coding. Okay? Now they're searching 12 and a half meters off from the correct location, which they got right during training because of the, of the preserving the special vector that they observed during training. Now, as you recall in this condition, we then on trial three added two landmarks. Now this is kind of interesting. First one, when we add two landmarks, they don't get it, what's going on. Um, one of the things that's going on is some of the kids are using one landmark as a vector, and some of the landmarks are using other, the other landmark for a vector. We're not able, using that model, we can account for about half of the performance, and the other, other kids, this is the only cell in which the data don't make sense. Um, they're just off, they don't get it. Finally, this is an interesting thing. Now we alter the landmarks, and now they get it right. What's going on? We think that what happened here is that they discovered the possibility of relational coding. Remember now, these were close together and these were relatively far apart in the two trials. When the child missed the toy here, we allow them to search for two minutes, and after trotting through all the tall grass, we finally show them. It's just a little four-inch alligator buried deep in the thing. We, <laughs> we had a little trouble ourselves at times. It's hard to see. Um, it should be hard to see. Um, but eventually, most people find it except in this condition. So we show them, look, it's here. Okay. Then they see the two landmarks at that point. Okay. So now, right during that point where we're showing them the wrong crop, they are in essence getting the same training that the two landmark condition got. They are seeing two landmarks and something in the thing. So something kicks in and says, aha, it can be in the middle. And then they get it right. So after previously failed, now when we spread them further apart, this should be harder because the landmarks are further apart. Uh, but it's actually now easier, and we think it's the comparison alignment, if you will, of seeing two things that are similar and different, and then saying, hey, there's a relation here. And then once again, they fail test four, showing it's not distant landmarks. So four-year-olds cold in the middle relation. There's some people doing work back home that are working on three-year-olds in a, in a task that doesn't involve grass and stuff. Um, and the results are mixed. Uh, I'm not sure three-year-olds can do this, uh, it's, it, relational thinking is a little bit later and a little bit harder, so I wouldn't be surprised if this is something that happens between three and four. They also coded the vectors. They coded both. These, the, the, we titled this paper, One Hidden Landmark, Two Spatial Codes, because they coded one landmark in two different ways. Okay. So thus far, I've demonstrated that uh, we can have the possibility of relational coding in, in young kids. Okay. Interesting, but now what good does that do us? Now, I want to talk about the possibility of using that, recruiting that ability, if you will, to um, aid spatial coding, uh, to extract relational patterns and, and use what we know about things in the world to solve spatial problems. Um, so my second goal then was to consider a new explanation for difficulties that children have in inferring a geometry to use as a basis for search. And as I said, my, my sort of theoretical idea here is the, the reason that children succeeded in the, um, in the uh, Spelke and Herman and succeed is because they don't have to infer anything. They have four walls. In a very simple version of a relational task where they don't really have to infer much, like ours, they succeeded. Now we're going to try to see, well, then why do they fail um, when uh, you have to infer it? And at the same time, I'll be talking about the ability to infer. Okay. So what does this look like to you? Okay. How many people didn't see the dog right away? Good. Um, what, what, it faded. Okay. Well, that was my... Okay. It's a dog. Okay. Now, uh, what we did in this experiment is um, take a structure that can be conceived of in two different ways. It's a set of unrelated locations or it's a dog. And our question is, can children recruit the uh, relational understanding, the figure, to uh, facilitate mapping and search. This is something that actually happens quite a bit in the real world. Uh, when w for stars and constellations, we do this all the time. And, and I've looked across cultures, and there, there are differences in constellations that we, we might name something a, a lobster, where another culture might name it a crab or something. But this is something that people do a lot. And in other languages, it's even more common. Uh, we're, we're talking about, like, 
the mouth of a, of a hammer or something in cell tall. It's, it's a very common thing that we do because it allows us to take what we know and push it on to spatial information that's hard to talk about otherwise. So we can say it's in the mouth of the dog or something like that. And, and now these relations that are so hard to describe become tractable and communicable, communicable like a disease. Okay. Um, so in the, in the basic version of this task, we assign children randomly uh, to use one of two maps. These are maps that look like that. These are the actual maps. Um, on one hand, we make the dog pattern obvious. On the other hand, we don't. Everybody searches in the same space. There are no lines, at least in this first experiment, in the actual space that they searched in. This is what everybody has to do. So the question is this. Given that you've gotten this alternate construal, can you take that and push it and map it on to a larger space? Can you see this new space in terms of what we saw on the map? And the way we know that is by whether children gain a search advantage we had them search for 10 locations that were hidden on separate trials at each of the uh, uh, 10 different locations scattered across the dog. Uh, do they gain an advantage from having seen the dog before? Remember, though, everybody's looking on the same space. What differs is the map. And this kind of violates the... Yeah, yes, George. So are the hiding places under the dots or something? Yes, I forgot that slide. Uh, you can kind of see it. They're pointing to one. Yes, I did forget the slide that shows the 10 hiding locations, but I have it further down. Okay, so we hide it under one of these disks, and the child has to go in and find it. At five-year-old, there's a significant advantage. Knowing that these can form a dog helps you. Uh, the no-lines condition was, they're, they're not out to lunch. 54% correct is actually way above chance, but because um, chance is 10 out of 27 divided by 10 or something. Anyway, it's a, it's a small number. And um, they uh, do well, but they uh, they don't. Uh, they, they still gain an advantage. Now, for um, four-year-olds, there's no uh, statistically significant advantage. It's an approach statistical ex significance. It's not that they're not doing anything. 39% is still pretty good. But what they can't do is take this pattern that they've seen and push it onto the space and see and gain the advantage from it. Three-year-olds were just barely above chance, and of course, gain no advantage. Okay. Now, one thing you might notice about this is that. Um, when we, um, when we put lines on it, what I'm saying it's doing is giving us this meaningful figure that we're mapping on to the space. And I'll have more evidence for that later, but one question that arises from a perceptual psychology point of view is about um, parsing of parts. We know that people uh, parse locations in terms of like local minima. And when I draw lines here, I, I break this down into parts. So my argument is that they're, they're carrying a structure over. They're thinking about this new space as a dog and that it's helping them. Uh, make the relationships tractable cognitively. But there is another explanation, which is that sort of a lower level explanation. What I've done is, is help them sort of parse it into parts. It doesn't matter that those parts form a dog. It's just that I've given them the, a divisibility of the space, and maybe they can use that, that coding in some way. And so what we did to address that is take the same dog and basically scramble him up. So he has the same number of parts. In fact, he has the same parts, but in a different spatial arrangement. Uh, but this is a meaningless arrangement. Now, we, we're doing some experiments to see if we can transfer from the dog, we call it dog to hedgehog, but can we get the, the dog to, to transfer? But the baseline result is when it doesn't form a meaningful pattern, um, there's no advantage for seeing the line. So it can't be just parts. Okay. Um, another sort of demonstration of the power of this is to help us solve a problem that normally is very difficult. Many people in this room and elsewhere have... Uh, done studies with rotated maps. And rotated maps are interesting because they, they put um, perceptual similarity and conceptual similarity sort of in opposition. Okay? Because it's communicating the same information, but if you just rely on spatial correspondences or ego, e egocentric correspondences between what it looks like to me and then what it looks like when I walk into the room, you're going to fail. You'll make a uh, very characteristic error uh, that we call the egocentric error. So what this child has done in this example is code this location in, partly in relation to his body, her body, and goes out and searches on the left and gets it wrong in the rotated condition. You all see that? Right? So now the, the dog thing predicts something different. So if you can still think about the structure, even when it's rotated, 
rotation shouldn't matter as much, right? Because it's still a dog. I mean, you have to rotate the dog, but the dog helps you rotate the structure as a whole. And so we looked at the advantage, we looked at the correct searches and the number of egocentric errors. So this is the original lines group. Egocentric errors were very rare. Okay, this is uh, the, the no lines group. So what, what happened is uh, when, we, when we, it's not the original, ro this is the rotated lines group. When we rotate the dog, uh, we get very, very few egocentric errors and proportionally many more correct searches. It's still a little bit harder, but not radically worse than chance harder, which it is for the people who don't have the no line. So this is another example of sort of, we're not just f um, limited to the structures that we can perceive and the way we can code it. We can go beyond that structure and use that for spatial coding. So uh, children less than five did not use the dog pattern to guide search and they couldn't take the pattern and map transfer to, search, to the search space. Now, let me tell you about another study that sort of is a different converging method that gets at this question and I think helps us to address a little bit more how this advantage might be accruing. In this thing, rather than um, have them search, we had them tell another person where the thing was hidden. So it's a very simple setup. Uh, everybody in this case gets the lines map. So you have... Uh, a uh, second experimenter or confederate uh, sitting there and um, the experimenter puts a little dot of clay on one of these 27 locations and says, can you tell, uh, can the participant tell Cynthia, who was the second experimenter, uh, where the dot would be on your board? Okay, so it's basic referential, referential communication task. Okay, in this case everybody had the lines but we also did it on no lines. But there was always a match. So either you had the lines and your interlocutor had the lines or you didn't have the lines and your interlocutor didn't have the lines. Okay, here are the actual search locations or communication locations. Okay, uh, one thing that we've done based on a lot of research that shows I did it in this script, not everybody saw the dog without some kind of prompt that says look for some kind of structure. People don't necessarily spontaneously did it do it, so we, did, we tried a prompt where we said, it was very simple, does this look like anything to you? Not, is, do you see a dog, but just in general, trying to invite the possibility of transcending what they saw and thinking about it in an alternative way. Okay, um, these are results for how kids answer that question, does this look like anything with you, in the no lines condition. Okay, in the lines condition, almost everybody, even four-year-olds said, a dog, a few kids say a cat or, or moose or reindeer. Uh, there's a few answers like that, but almost all, I think all but two, are very clear animate object okay, in the lines condition. In the no lines condition, the four-year-olds just didn't get it. They just said, no, it doesn't look like anything to me. And you can see that that increases with age to the point where adults do get it uh, almost all the time. So when prompted, most adults see a dog, most four-year-olds don't see anything. Um, now, did the participants use the figure in their descriptions? So what we're having you do is tell another person where it is on the, um, on the other board. This, you could do this in many ways. We're looking at did they use the dog pattern. For example, it's in the dog's ear, two up from the, from the top of the head. There's a pretty good description uh, on the left side. That would do it. Okay. And you can see that when you're prompted, uh, there's the same developmental pattern. If you, if you see it, you use it. If you don't see it, you don't use it. So these four-year-olds, when I asked them, does it look like anything to you? They said no. And not surprisingly, they didn't talk about the dog in their descriptions. Um, the, the adults, when I said, does it look like anything to you? They said, yeah, a dog. And they used the dog a whole lot in their descriptions. So. Uh, this gets more interesting as we look at to what's going on here, what's causing this. Okay, now, uh, does this make any difference? Does it help? Well, it certainly helps us in the real world because um, we can talk about constellations or quadrangles or shapes of uh, panhandles of states and things like that. Um, does it make any difference in this description task? It turns out not to be the easiest question to answer because what's good and what's bad? You know, what's a good description? And what we did is we coded it from a scale of uh, 0 to 4, where 4 is, provides the information that eliminates all foils, and 0 is, 
provides no useful information. You gave me that description, I still am at 1 out of 27. And we also validated this by having judges who didn't know the, the uh, pattern do the same task. And it correlates very highly. So the specificity score is just a way to score it. And for two things to note about the slide is first that adults are really good uh, regardless of whether they use the dog pattern or not. Uh, children who do use the dog pattern, those few who saw it and did use it, gained a huge advantage. Okay? An untractable task becomes tractable. So it, it works, but most of them didn't see it, at least in the four-year-olds. Four now, one thing you should be asking yourself is, yeah, 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 but adults talk more than um, kids do. So maybe it's just, maybe they're gaining this advantage simply because they say more. Well, those of you who've had a six-year-old should know that that's not true. Um, six-year-olds are actually were the kings and queens of talking in this study. They actually talked more than the adults did. Now, the four-year-olds talked a little bit less than adults did. And how do I know how much they talk? We coded each of the unique characteristics of the figure that they mentioned. Vertical, horizontal, dog parts, um, all the different ways you could describe this. And we just summed those different things that they mentioned. And that gives us a kind of measure of how much they talked. So the important point here is that it's not total amount of information. It's really how you use the information. Because if it were total amount of information, the five-year-olds and the adults don't differ at all in total amount of information provided, but they differ dramatically in how good their um, descriptions are. Okay, This is the same result uh, except just looking at references to the dog. Um, adults actually mention the dog less. What's going on here? Um, and um, what we did to look at that is that we, uh, we now have children uh, look at the same figure, but we connect it with lines. And as I said, everybody sees the dog, but the question is, what do they talk about? And here the results started to, to really make sense to us. The adults go back and forth between local and global properties of the figure. So they'll say something like I just said. It's in the dog's ear, two up from the top, third circle over. And notice that in doing that, I used both systems of reference in the same sort of mindset, if you will. I took the global information, I took the local information, I put them together. That's why adults can get by with saying less. Because if you get it specific and you pick out just the right information, then you, you know when to use a dog, when not to use the dog, and you get the two together. The younger kids, what they did, once we connected it with lines, now they talked almost exclusively about the dog. Whereas before they didn't even see a dog, now when they see a dog, it's in his, it's in his ear, it's in his second ear, it's in his tail. So what they're doing now is talking only about the dog and not talking about the more local properties. Okay, so you can think of this structure in two different ways. Okay, and to, to describe something like this, this one you really benefit greatly from both local and global. This is a really good example. Try describing that locally only. It isn't easy. I mean, you can do it, but it's a lot of work. If you start off by saying it's in the dog's back near his neck, we just eliminated about two-thirds of the locations right away, at least. And then we can focus in using global, local properties to specify the location. So here in graphical form is the result I just talked about. Uh, these, when we connect the dog figure with lines, so everybody can see the dog, we get a very interesting pattern of results. Now the kids talk almost exclusively about the global thing. We coded their, whether they coded it global, local, or both. The adults, in contrast, particularly you know, comparing four-year-olds and adults, you see a very, very different pattern. Some of the trials, adults rely completely on global. Some of the trials, adults rely completely on local. And on the largest number of trials, they use both. So some strategies, you don't need uh, local information. If it's in the nose, there's only one dot that satisfies that criteria. If it's in the top of the back, you really need both. And adults could pick whichever one they wanted. So basically what we have is, if there's no lines, kids don't see a dog. If there are lines, they see nothing but the dog. Okay. Or at least they talk nothing about the dog. Okay. So I think what we have here is an, an insight into why these inference problems have been so hard for young kids, why they have the ability to think relationally but then don't unless um, we use a really familiar figure. And I think it relates to a, sort of an interesting and classic problem in perceptual psychology of having to do with how we perceive ambiguous figures or local and global figures. Uh, everybody knows the rabbit duck, right? 
I think the I is right in the middle, so this is 50-50 for most adults, I think. Um, I know you, this, this can be perceived either as a rabbit or a duck. Okay, Gopnik and Rosati did some interesting studies, and Irv Rock before that, where uh, they did basically uh, ambiguous figures with young kids. And once again, before age five, what we see is uh, the kids have a whole lot of trouble thinking simultaneously about both construals of the figure. So what they can do, they can say it's a rabbit, then Gopnik and Rosati tried everything they could do, say, look, it's a duck, it's a duck. No, what do you see? Rabbit, rabbit, rabbit. Then finally, maybe they move that eye way over, and the kids say, duck. Say, great. Okay, what was it before? Duck. So what, what you're not getting there is this flexibility. And they really have claimed, and pretty strongly, that this is real, uh, that, that, that what the, the core component here is the lack of cognitive flexibility to think simultaneously about both construals. Even older research by um, a person whose name I can't remember um, uh, did something quite similar to what, to what I did but without the description part. What do you see here? Well, kids less than five, once again, say, I see an apple, a pear, a strawberry, and a banana. Um, do you see a face? Uh, some said that, yes, some said no. If they got the face, what do you see now? A face. So again, it's these two controls. And what I'm saying is I'm extending that to the notion of global and local. I'm saying global and local information can be thought of in the same way as this ambiguous figure. You have to think simultaneously about two controls of the same information. Adults flexibly go back and forth between those. Young kids don't, and that's the big developmental change. This is also consistent with Zalazo's theories about cognitive complexity and control, and he says that this is a general tendency in cognitive development to, um, to be able to think about two alternate construals of the same thing. And I think uh, it also applies to spatial cognition. Okay, let me turn now to symbol systems and the influences of language maps and gesture. Um, when, when I talk about maps, I like to start with this quote because it kind of captures what maps can do for us. This, this could be apocryphal, but I think it's true, uh, where somebody in Germany actually drove into a river because the map showed no river or that there was a bridge or something. Okay, I think it's true. Um, now, the important point of this is no bird or gerbil is going to do that. You know, look at a computer screen and say, I'll rely on that rather than what I see or smell or taste or whatever. Uh, and no young child's going to do that. It's only in adults where uh, we can actually transcend our own direct experience and rely on symbol systems instead. Uh, th this is what, how important maps are to us. They actually make us see the world differently. And, and this error kind of makes that point. So here are some of the things that I think using maps or other diagrams might do for us spatially. And it's kind of things that young kids really have trouble with. And it's the kind of thing that I think that becoming aware of spatial symbol systems actually might give us explicit models of how to think about space that actually might help us with some of the things that kids traditionally have trouble before. They help give us a perspective that transcends direct experience. You know, it's easy to forget that until 1958, I think, no one had seen what the world looks like from above. I mean, you'd climb mountains and stuff, but the whole world, no one had, had seen that. They highlight relations, or at least had the potential to. Um, you can think about where one city is in relation to each other because of the small scale and because of the way they're represented. Now we get a pattern. You've all had that experience of seeing things on a map that you never knew about the world. Um, one of my office mates in, in Ann Arbor, not either of the people that Georgina mentioned, I'll never forget, uh, we were talking, I was talking about going canoeing and all the things you could do on the river in Ann Arbor, and she said, there's a river in Ann Arbor? And uh, a map um, gives, you know, if you looked at a map of Ann Arbor, you'd see this big, river going right through the middle of it. So um, it's a different, different kind of perspective on space. She had relied more on direct experience and hadn't gotten that far to the north. Um, it helps us to think about space as space. When you think about it, it's only in a weird talk like this that we'd sit around talking about space. Most of the time what we do is navigate, and we're you know, perfectly good getting through it. Um, but when you say, let's talk about space, it's not something that we really need to do to navigate very well. It's not something that we, we normally do uh, unless we are making some kind of explicit spatial description, land transaction, something like that. Maps help us abstract space away from direct experience and think about it. 
They can also help us think about uh, relations that might not be obvious, what I call inferencing. Um, this is a historical example from um, 15th century Portugal um, that shows sort of the, the, the emergence of this uh, effect of maps on spatial thinking. To you, it looks like a map of Africa upside down. But upside down compared to what is the question? What the way this was drawn was um, from the bow of a ship. So gradually over time, people start recording the turns that they would make in their boat and the ports that they could find. The structure of Africa emerged from that. They didn't set out to say, let's make a map of Africa upside down. This is a historical and developmental process that led to this. And the reason it's upside down is it kind of represents a middle point in the transition. The structure has emerged, but they're still looking at it from the direct experience perspective, as it would look from the bow. Before this, all people used were uh, descriptions and written descriptions of ports. If you look at English guidebooks from you know, the 15th, 16th century, they're just lists of where to turn and places you can have a beer or whatever, places you could sleep. They don't have maps. A hundred years later, there's maps everywhere. So it's a kind of a cognitive revolution. And, and I think that that goes on in individual children in our society. Now, Piaget and many others have described uh, kids' spatial thinking uh, as non-relational and non-sort of map-like. One description is that kids lack survey knowledge. So in this task, what Piaget is having them do is in essence make um, maps of Geneva with little squares and houses and things like that. And what, what this is, uh, this perfectly describes the, the consistent result that he got is that kids kind of merge spatial understanding and interest and conceptual understanding. They put the candy store next to the house. Uh, they represent routes that they travel frequently as more close than they are. Uh, they might put things together just because they like them. Um, what they're not doing is making a map that looks like a map. What they're not doing is thinking abstractly about the space separated from experience. And I think that's one of the things that coming to use maps and diagrams could do for us, make us take a step back, if you will, from direct experience and think about the space as space. So um, I'm going to tell you briefly about studies that we have been doing to, uh, to look at this and um, motivated in part by Laura Novick's work on what different kinds of uh, representations could do for us. Um, in this study, we compared learning a space from language to learning a space from a map. And this is a classic depiction versus description issue. Language is good for a lot of things. Um, I use language every day. Some of my best friends use language. But it has this limitation. When you're describing uh, spatial relations, you can only do one at a time. Now, you mentally might make a model. That's debatable. And some people in this room have challenged that whole idea. But uh, if you're just describing it, all you can say is one relation at a time. Maps immediately depict relations amongst things. And you can think si simultaneously about relations amongst them. What we had children do is learn this six-room space that looks just like this, either from these descriptions or from a map. And then we had, um, these are, I think, six, eight, and ten-year-olds. We had them um, then do spatial tasks that, that assess how they think about the relations that they've either heard or seen. We have them stand in one room and point to, uh, to rooms that are out of sight. And we also have them construct a model of the space. Okay, the first thing to note is that um, the map conveys an advantage actually for everybody. There's actually no significant interaction between age and condition here, which sort of surprised us. Uh, the, the inference, the, the verbal task is hard even for adults, although they're significantly better than kids. But the diagram conveys a real significant advantage. It allows you to think about relations, and you don't have to sit there and put them together in your head. Now, when we looked at the eight-year-old's uh, model constructions, the first thing we thought was, this is just bad data because they were all different and they didn't make any sense. When we looked a little bit closer. We noticed that there was, even though they don't look like this, they do preserve something, and that's the contiguity relationships. So if you notice, the pig is next to the cat, and the pig is next to the cat in most of them, and so on. So what they were doing is reflecting in their model the language that they heard. So they had not abstracted beyond the words. They took the language as it came in, one relation at a time, and they outputted that one relation at a time. They didn't abstract to form what would be something like a cognitive map, at least from language. But the map 
uh, helps you do that. Um, and it's not, you might say, well, when you give them a map, it's not really fair because you're giving them the what and where information. It's kind of complex. Uh, it's too much information to really test your thing accurately. So what we did is try to, try to capture the unique part of what the map is doing, which is giving you the structure, giving you the relations amongst them. So in this uh, condition, what we did is show them just the outline briefly. Say the playhouse looks like this. Take it away. Then they have to memorize the descriptions. And that's just as good as showing them the full map. So what we try to do here is capture what maps uniquely can do for us, which is think about relations amongst locations in a way that transcends the serial nature of language. I'm running out of time, but let me very... Th am I out of, officially out of time? Okay, let me briefly talk about our work with gesture, because that's new and kind of interesting to me. This is the guy that comes up uh, number one on Google Gesture. So he's Google Gesture guy. He represents gesture for us. Um, now, this is not going to be hard for you, because you've already seen... Uh, not everything I do is a two by three boxes, but um, this one is. Let's say I came into this room and I started with this slide. Let's see, here are the boxes, one, two, three, one, two, three. And you read this description, which is what an actual child, eight-year-old child, after experiencing the six rooms, gave to her mom. And I said to you, draw the configuration. Some of you might, well, all of you now would get it right. But at the beginning of today, uh, it would be hard. In fact, you would look a lot like this, because these satisfy those sets of constraints. But if we watch, this girl's just... Okay, the important point about this is all of the spatial information, 100%, is given in our hands. Without our hands, you get no spatial information. You just give sequential information. This girl at eight year old is actually a little quite unusual for her age. Uh, she actually looks a lot more like an adult. What we've been studying and asking is what role might gesture play both in communicating and thinking about spatial information, and how might that influence development? When people study spatial information, it's been almost always from uh, maps direct experience or language. And, but communication, particularly about space, almost always involves gesture. And what we're looking at, and I'm just going to have time to give you the sort of the shadow outline of it, is the relation between developing mental representations of space and what people choose to communicate in their hands when we ask them to communicate to their parent. Okay. Um, this seems to be as close to a cognitive uh, cultural universal as we can find. These are individuals in, in Nick Enfield's study who are uh, illiterate and don't use maps, but use complex diagrammatic-like representations in their hands to communicate things like kinship questions. And he's wonderfully good at asking just the right question to get them to do this. Here's a question about whether a person can marry another person, whether you know, they have complex kinship rules. And they're trying to communicate these to why a person could or could not marry another person. And what's interesting is this person holds particular places in space, holds that stable, and then uses the other hand to communicate hierarchical or descendancy relationships. And this relationship really means something. His, um, this is father, father, ego, brother, father, ego, brother, descendant. Okay, and this guy uses an even more abstract system that is using absolute space. Where his hand is in space <laughs> means real information, the metric information in this case. So um, this... So even though um, not all cultures use maps, they do seem to have at least implicit the, the, the ability to do complex, abstract, representational information with their hands. So hands might be even more important than diagrams. And there's a certain relationship between gesture and maps. Matisse captured it well in, in that um, it's likely that drawing evolved from gestures, if you will, or s sort of sketching things in sand and things like that where... Um, you are using your hands to communicate spatial information, and eventually that can be archived on paper or rock or sand or whatever. Okay. So what we do is expose people to the space that's similar to, although not identical to, the one I showed you, and then we have them describe it to their parent or experimenter. Okay. There's our hanging dog. And they experience two routes through it. Okay. Uh, and then we code the verbal description alone, 
the, the gesture alone, and then we put them together to ask developmentally what information is captured in hands, what information is captured in speech, and what forms do the gestures take. Okay, so these are the kinds of questions that we ask. Okay, well, here's the answer to the developmental question. When we look at um, the, uh, do the kids provide a layout? So let me describe what an adult does. Look, it's a two by three. So they bo do both with speech and gesture. Kids do neither. They do something like this, the, the old traditional root knowledge. First there's a the dog, then there's a pig, then there's a cat, et cetera, et cetera. And they, do, they can do that completely. It doesn't involve any spatial information. It's just sequential speech. The adult pattern is the opposite, where they provide both. And the uh, middle-aged kids are in the middle. Um, so what's happening is, is kids at first don't gesture very much at all. They just sit there and say, this after this, after this, after this. The question is, do they know it or not? Versus, is this a chosen form of communication? Is, do they not have the information, or do they not wish to communicate it as a model? And it turns out it's a communicative strategy. They do know it, but they don't communicate in gesture. Okay. When, when kids did gesture, which was rarely, uh, they often looked like they were actually describing the space, uh, the, the actual space they'd seen. It was really loud before. Okay, I can just tell you very quickly what he's doing. You notice how he's extending his elbow out as if he were in the actual room itself, right? Now, I have to say, I did not ask this woman to wear a Vanderbilt sweatshirt. She just happened to be... <laughs> and she's the smartest person we have. And it's pretty much shaped like a dog. And there are six boxes, and each box has an animal on it. Um, the first one... She's got the structure down, even if she doesn't have the animals. Okay. So this Vanderbilt girl, we call her, is um, <laughs> the best example we have, but there are many others, of what we call a model-like gesture. In essence, she's using her hands as if they were a map. And she's telling you about that by saying, look, here's the structure. And notice the size. It's all within the body space, uh, as opposed to the kid who's way out here with the full elbow extended. And the difference we're, th we're, we're basically saying, sort of to wrap it up, is that what the adults are doing is thinking as if they had a map in front of them. They are basically giving you a map with their hands. What the kids are doing, either not gesturing at all, or when they do gesture, they uh, try to recreate the direct experience in the room. In essence, this is symbolically mediated, this is not. This is a recounting of direct experience. Now, that could lead to all kinds of arguments, but we can have it at dinner. Let me show you one more result, and then we can quit. This, um, okay. What happens when we ask the kids to gesture? Um, now, I'm going to... We Look at her exaggerated gestures. Okay. In essence, just saying, can you tell, use your hands to tell your mom where the animals are? Nothing about showing the layout, nothing about showing a structure, just those simple instructions turned 8 out of the 11 kids into essentially just like adults. The top-down thing is very characteristic of the model, as if they have something in front of them, they're sharing it with you, and I'm going to put these things into the correct position. So it's not that the kids don't know it, it's what they don't think about is in the communicative act what information would be better? How should we interpret where? 
And for an adult, that's negotiated as, I need to give you layout information. I need to give you something that gives you the advantages of a map, and I'm going to do that with my hands. For the kid, they know it, they can do it, but they don't spontaneously do it. So the gesture is there, but implicit, if you will. And we think that part of this comes about from keeping looking at ways that we communicate space. We lay it out in front of us, and that's part of what kids learn. To investigate um, just how much difference uh, do they... How much difference does it does, does having access to your gestures actually make any difference or not? We're looking at these uh, blindfolded adults, and you, they they take to this right away. It's not as weird as it looks. <laughs> see, again, you, even though he can't even see his hands, you're getting this basically the same thing. Not quite as good because he doesn't know where his hands are, but. He still wants to give you this configuration information. Okay, I am out of time. Um, I can't tell you about my journal, journey of recovery. But I will say one concluding thing, and that is way down here. Wow, how did I ever think I was going to do all that? Okay, um, when John Glenn was making his first orbit of the Earth. He said, I can see the whole layout. Uh, no, he didn't. He can say, that I can see the whole state of Florida just laid out like on a map. Now, to most people, what this, if I said, what's this about? You'd say, well, it's, it's about the, the awe of space travel. He was looking down the Earth for the first time, at least for an American, and uh, he's seeing this whole structure that he couldn't see before. But what it's saying to me is it really captures what maps do for us. They give us the ability to see the big picture. It took the effort and expense to boost him into space to give him the same information that MAPS gave him already. Thanks. Sorry about the time. I've done that. I've talked before. I don't know what happened.